Welcome to the podcast that will teach you how to successfully invest in and build steady streams of passive income from the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Veteran real estate investors Kevin Bupp and Charles DeHart from Mobile Home Park Academy will personally share with you the valuable lessons they've learned along their journey as mobile home park investors so that you too can learn how to build massive cash flow and huge profits from this extremely lucrative niche. So without further ado, let's welcome your hosts for today's show, Kevin Bupp and Charles DeHart. Welcome, guys and gals, to the Mobile Home Park Investing Weekly Podcast, where we'll provide all the information that you need to know to successfully locate, negotiate, close on, and make huge profits from the lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. I'm your host, Kevin Bupp, and in today's show, we're going to be speaking with mobile home park insurance expert, Kurt Kelly. Now, Kirk is the president of Mobile Insurance, which insures more mobile home park and retailers than any other agency in the country. He's an honors graduate from both the University of Colorado and the University of Oklahoma Law School. Kurt has been a part of mobile insurance since 1996 when it had only five employees. Kurt's not only proud of the company's steady growth and extraordinary client retention rate, but also of the nice home and job stability it provides for all of mobile's employees. Kurt is also the president of Expert Climate Control LLC, a heating and air conditioning company specializing in multifamily projects and headquartered in Texas. Kurt owns and manages multiple investment real estate properties as well. His favorite hobbies include regular workday lunches with his wife, climbing, skiing, motorcycling, target shooting, and reading. So guys, today we're going to cover the exciting topic of insurance, but more specifically, the ins and outs of properly insuring your mobile home park to ensure overall peace of mind knowing that your valuable asset is adequately protected. And I think one of the most important considerations that you need to take into account as you listen to today's show is that not all insurance agencies are created equal. And engaging a specialist who has years of experience within your specific industry, whether it's mobile home parks or apartment complexes or any other types of real estate, but finding someone that has that, that's a specialist within that industry is by far the best course of action to take. And so with that, I'm anxious to get onto the show with Kurt, but before we do, here's a quick word from our show sponsor, Sunrise Capital Investors. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here with Sunrise Capital Investors. As you are hopefully already well aware if you've been a listener for any period of time, my goal has always been to provide you with as much value as I possibly can through my two podcasts, Real Estate Investing for Cashflow and the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. As our audience continues to grow, literally, we've been downloaded millions of times by folks in over 125 countries. I've had thousands of people reach out looking to get involved in our niche. And that's the phenomenal niche of mobile home park investing. For those that don't know, I've been a full-time real estate investor for nearly 20 years now, and I've personally invested in and have owned apartment complexes, various commercial properties, hundreds of single-family rentals, and I've interviewed some of the most successful investors in just about every other asset class, and I've arrived at this one very simple conclusion. Mobile home parks are hands down the best investment I've found to date. Why? They provide investors with the best risk-adjusted returns out of any other real estate sector that I've seen. Investing in real estate can get complicated, and I really want to simplify this process for you. If you're someone who wants to diversify away from the uncertainty of Wall Street and allocate a percentage of, of your real estate portfolio to mobile home parks, but maybe you don't have the time nor the inclination to personally locate good deals yourself, then our team will do it for you. At Sunrise Capital Investors, our team specializes in the acquisitions and management of undervalued and highly profitable mobile home parks. And we are now providing accredited investors with an opportunity to participate directly alongside our team in our up-and-coming deals. And let me say this, I believe that we are hands down the best in our space at sourcing highly profitable off-market deals. That's really what makes us unique in this niche and as investment managers. As stewards of your capital, we truly are aligned with our investors. We've structured our investment fund so that we as a company are incentivized in the same way the investor is, which is through the performance of the investment itself. In addition, we want to make sure that we not only make money for our investors, but that they understand how it's being made. 
That's why we provide our accredited partners with a private monthly podcast that walks them through the detailed updates on how their investment is performing. And we're very transparent, providing you with the good, the bad, and the ugly at times. And so if you'd like to learn more about the partnership opportunities with our team here at Sunrise, please go visit sunrisecapitalinvestors.com and click on the investors link to get signed up. It's absolutely free and you'll get placed on the priority list of when new opportunities come along. Also, feel free to call us at 833 Cash Flow Without the O. Again, that's 833 Cash Flow Without the O. And one of our investor relations team members will help you schedule an appointment to speak with one of our managing principals. If you have questions, go ahead and schedule a call and let's get on the phone and talk. And with that, guys, I'd like to leave with one last thought. From the time that I wake up in the morning to the time that I lay my head down the rest of the evening, My number one priority with everything I do, whether it be recording this podcast, working for our investors, helping each of you reach your investment goals, to providing a great experience to each of our residents who reside in our communities, is to add huge amounts of value to everyone that I come in contact with. Now, with that being said, I look forward to the opportunity of bringing value to you through Sunrise and through this podcast. Thank you for your time. Now, let's go ahead and get back to the show. All right, guys. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today's show, Kurt Kelly. Kurt, how are you doing today? Good, Kevin. Thanks for the phone call, the time. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. I know you're a busy man. You've got a lot of things going on over there at Mobile Insurance. And um, so I appreciate you coming on the show here. And I'm, I'm real excited to talk about this topic today. I mean, I think to the average person, insurance probably isn't the most exciting topic, but it's, it's an important one, right? It's one that we have to think about, especially if we're going to be uh, real estate investors, more specifically buying mobile home parks, or, which are kind of niche, right? It's, and, and what I like to tell folks is that, and what I just said a couple of minutes ago, is that you really need to, you need to find a specialist that, that, that really focuses within the space. And this is, what you, this is one of the many things that you guys do there at Mobile Agency. And so, what I'd love for you to do, Kurt, if, if you don't mind, take a few minutes and just for those that aren't familiar with you, that don't know anything about you and your company, take a few minutes, tell us a bit about yourself and also what it is you guys do there at Mobile Insurance. Well, see, I'm a refugee from the legal industry. Uh, I was in trial all the time and around people when they're at their lowest moment. And I decided that life was too short to continue in that. And I uh, went to work for a mobile, which was a spinoff of General Electric back when General Electric used to be the 21st of the mobile home industry. They used to do most of the financing and they decided uh, they were going to exit. Mobile was a little bit of a company left over after that. My stepfather ran it for a few years and then uh, I worked for him in 96 and then bought it from him in 98. And now today mobile is a uh, specialty, just exactly like you were talking about, a specialty insurance provider of insurance for mobile home parks, mobile home retailers, and mobile home transporters, installers. I think we insure more of those clients than anybody else in the country. Um, We have all of our agents. That's what they do most of the day. It is very specialized. I was thinking about it when you're talking about specialty. I own, uh, I don't insure my own house. I don't insure my own car. Uh, um, I've got a office warehouse or two that I don't insure because they're just not in my expertise. I have people that insure those and uh, have programs that give me more value and have a little bit more insight in them. So uh, I I take advantage of your recommendation myself and use people <laughs> that are specific. Okay. Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, um, we're speaking in generalities there, but what, you know, and, and I kind of said, you know, it's important to find a specialist. You're saying the same thing, but what does that really mean? I mean, you know, being that, that you're an insurance broker, you can, you can pretty much write any type of property insurance there is, but you're a specialist in the mobile home park niche. Why is that really important? Give me some more specifics if you would. Well, it, it's, it's twofold. One, you know what to insure, what not to insure, what coverage forms to include, because you've seen over time what losses occur and what don't. And it's, it's, it's real typical for me to have someone call me and say, hey, Kurt, would you look at my insurance? And I look at it and it's completely, it's completely wrong. They've left out 70% of the coverage or 40% of the key coverage that they need to have. It's just been by either A, they've been burned and they've called me or, or B, by the grace of God, they haven't been. So we look at it. So it means that we know what to buy and we know what not to buy too. The other thing it means is we do business with insurance companies that have developed insurance programs specifically for community owners. So they've developed coverage for community owners. They give because they do. They know it. They're comfortable with it. So their rates are lower. 
than your typical insurance company is. You know, we're not the we don't we're not the lowest a hundred percent of the time, but we, we usually give the best value on everything because that's what our companies know, understand, like they know what it is. It's not unusual. Insurance companies are very specific and very discriminatory. I guess to say they like what they like and nothing else. The insurance company that likes to insure ice cream parlors does not want to insure mobile home parks and vice versa. So what we really bring is we bring the right partner to you as an insurance company, and we know which of those partners' issues, depending on what your operations are and where you're located, because legal environments change from state to state, that's what we bring to the table. And that's why I think we've got a 93% 93% retention rate, which is extraordinarily high for any insurance agency. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I guess the the fair warning I'll put out there to everyone that's listening is that, you know, and this goes along with what we're talking about here is just because maybe your family has been with State Farm or, you know, Allstate Insurance for many years, they insure your home, they insure your car, and you've got a great relationship and you get the best rates because you've been with them many, many years. doesn't mean that you you should go to that agent and have them you know, write you coverage for your mobile home park. And I think that where I'm going with this is what you have to be very careful of is, is that I see quite often, not just in the insurance world, but even in the mortgage world, it's, it's quite common that, hey, I've got a mobile home park, I need a loan for it. And you'll find a guy that says, oh, I can do that. Okay, you, can, you can do it, great. But are you the best fit for it, right? Do you have the best access to the the lenders that know and understand this product. And the same goes with, you know, your Allstate agent, your State Farm agent, right? They might tell you that they can write it and they're going to get you some bids or some quotes, but they're probably not the best suited for the job. And so you need to go find a specialist like Kurt and his team. And um, again, you know, don't don't risk it by going to someone that's uh, uneducated in this space. So Kurt, what I'd like to do here today, there's a lot to cover. And there's an article, I think the best way to approach this show, there's an article that you wrote, I don't know how many years ago, you've got a lot of content out there, you've got a lot of content, very helpful content uh, on your website, uh, on multiple other different blogs and websites out there in this industry. And I know you're a great contributor to our industry, so and thank you for that. Uh, but there's an article that you wrote that caught my attention many years ago, it's probably been years since I've, I've read it, um, that kind of covered some of the, the big, biggest aspects of the consideration of getting insurance on your mobile home park if you're a park owner and operator or if you're looking to buy a mobile home park. And so I think it was a top 10 mistakes is what that article was was labeled. And so what I'd love to do is just kind of run through that if you would. And we can add on anything that might be missing. If there's any other mistakes or topics that we need to be covering that are incredibly important for our listeners to know and understand. But so if we could, can we run through that? And, I, and I, I've got it here in front of me now. And so what I'd love to discuss is maybe the first one, the, the first mistake. It might not be the biggest mistake, but it's the first one here listed. And it's failure to ensure all the improvements within your policy. So, you know, ground utility, uh, infrastructure, signs, fences, smaller buildings, things of that nature. So can you speak to that a little bit and, and why that's a mistake? Well, you know, years years ago, I used to say I used to not encourage people sometimes to insure their fence or their sign because the primary thing that happens to those things is you get some drunk that runs through it and they just mm. knock out a section of fence and it's a thousand dollar loss and that might be your deductible or you might not report it anyway. But what we found, our experience has been over the years taught us different because when our customers get hit by the big storms, the catastrophic storms, then all the you know that twenty thousand dollars of fencing and uh, $20,000 of sign coverage and the 35000 on the shed and the contents, then all those bring great capital back into your company to restart when you have that major wind event. It's typically a wind or fire event that will wipe out a community like that. And so that money is just what saved our clients when they've had those catastrophic losses over the years. Another example would be we had a client one time and uh, have a lightning strike on their property and they hadn't done much due diligence with regarding to the utility services. And you know, I don't know if you, do you, you know, you know things that look like big trash cans that sit up on power poles, Kevin, have you ever seen those? I know what you're talking about. Yep. I don't know what they big are. Big canisters. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 sometimes here's, here's the news. Sometimes you own those as a community. Well, our customer found out because they got hit by it. They had a problem and a lightning strike hit one of those and they didn't have it insured. And that's $300,000 to replace. Oh my gosh. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of things that just, uh, for, that's the kind of thing that I hate to get that phone call as an insurance agent. Hey, Kurt, you never mentioned that. You never talked to me about that. So you'll find that when you talk to our agents, they're going to talk to you about it and mention it. You know, you don't have to do it. We don't care if you insure them, but we want you to know that that's a risk out there. So that's an example of, you know, not being comprehensive on insuring. So we recommend people be comprehensive on the insurance. And if they want to save money, which we're all about saving money, 
then just creep your deductibles up a little bit. Yep. That way you can handle a little loss, even five or $10,000 deductible, most of our clients can handle, but uh, they don't want to be stuck with a $200,000 uninsured claim. I'm, I'm assuming that example that you just gave there was a park that had master meter electric. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To where we don't see them that often here, uh, here in the part of the country we're in, in the Southeast, but uh, in the Midwest, I, I run across them quite often. So as you guys are out there looking, just take that into consideration. I had, I would have no idea if I looked at a park that had master meter electric, uh, that something like that, whatever that thing is, is that a capacitor? I don't know what it is that you're a transformer. Uh, I don't know. I, yeah. I can't remember the name of it. I'll remember that, three, I remember the $300,000 number. That's a big number. number. Like it was yeah, that's a, that's a big number. That, that, that could definitely uh, send you to the BK world if, uh, if you're not prepared for it. Uh, okay, right. well, fantastic. And then uh, let's move on to the, the, the second mistake here. And what you have listed as the second biggest mistake is just undervaluing the property itself. And uh, you know, folks using the tax value, insuring it for the tax value, but not the actual you know, current appraised value. So can you speak to that a little bit? Insurance presumes that you're going to insure things for the replacement cost value. That's the way it's all rated. That's the way it's priced. So when you're looking at a building, you might go out and buy a park and it's got a, a single story brick building with thousand square feet and it's an office building. And you look at that thing and you go, gee, I wouldn't value that more than $60,000. And that may be the fair market value of that building. But if you had to replace it, mm-hmm. you're probably talking a minimum of a hundred bucks a foot if you did it very spartanly. So what happened, what we, an example is we've had a customer over the years, we've had this happen multiple times. They go in and insure a building that's truly a $200,000 building to replace and they insure it for a hundred thousand. And sure enough, it has a fire and burns down. And not only they not get the $200,000 coverage, they get the hundred thousand dollars and they get penalized on the hundred thousand dollars, which is something called coinsurance, which is in place in almost every insurance policy in the country. And so they get penalized on that to the percentage they were underinsured, and they end up with a net take home of $55,000 to replace a $200,000 building. And wow. again, it's just not, that's just not where to gamble your money on your insurance or spend your money. Again, I prefer to, you know, a bigger deductible versus failing to insure to value. Talk to me about that penalty. How does that work? Okay. Well, every, every, almost every insurance policy, unless it's been appraised and every property has been appraised has something called a coinsurance clause in it, which means if you don't insure something to the value that it truly is to replace it, and they'll give you about a 20% wiggle room because none of us know for sure, but if you get outside of that, they're going to under they're going to underpay you to the percent you were underinsured. So if you are, let's say, 50% underinsured, you have just like the example, you, you, you've got a, you built, you insured a building for 100,000, but the true replacement cost was 200,000. They're going to give you a little bit of a leeway. So if you'd have been 160000 or more, no penalty. But after 160000 or lower, you get penalized. So mm. you're going to get 10 sixteenth of that $100,000 is your claim, less your deductible, which when it typically runs, comes in around about $60,000. So now you've got $60,000 to replace your $200,000 building. Mm-hmm. And that's when it gets painful as a real estate investor. So is this a situation where um, being with your firm, you guys would at, at renewal time every year, you would reevaluate the policy and you know construction costs have been rising over the last couple of years. You guys take a look at those types of things and ensure that, you know, whatever that replacement cost, whatever it was a year ago to ensure that that's adequate coverage for this coming year during renewal period. Is that something you guys look into? Well, that, that's a great question, and it's and here the, here's the good. There's good news and bad news. The good news is you, as the policy owner, are in control of that value, and the bad news is you, as the policy owner, are in control of that value. So we're by and large going off what you tell us. Now, if we see something that sounds unusual, our agents are all trained to say, "I know, Mr. Smith, you you built that building you know, 25 years ago at sixty dollars a foot, but all of our data now shows it's one hundred and twenty dollars a foot to re, to rebuild." And uh, sometimes our insurance carriers will step in too if they see something that's out of whack and say, hey, you ought to relook at this because we don't want to be the ones calling you at the bad time and said you don't have enough money. So we do help, but by and large, it's something that you as a person should watch. And, and be careful. Don't use that value from your tax appraised value mm-hmm. or the depreciated fair market value. You'll use the building replacement cost value for insurance purposes. That's what you should use. 
Yeah. And so I, that's probably a big fair warning for those that uh, might, might be buying a new, might be buying a community, but from a seller that's going to carry financing. In those situations, a lot of those buyers aren't going to get an appraisal done because they're not required to buy in a bank or a lending institution. In that scenario, it's going to be up to them to make a determination of the value of the structure. So I could see that going sideways in that scenario there where you're leaving it up to the owner and there, there was never appraiser involved that, that at least gave his best approach to valuing the replacement cost of those assets. And uh, now it's up to that owner that wants to be, you know, save as much money as possible, have his premium as low as possible, where they might underinsure, you know, those structures. So good, good point. And, and a lot of your bankers out there, and we've got a lot of good ones in our industry, you know, MJ Vukovic and the mm-hmm. DeMarco brothers and the guys at Sunstone. I mean, we've got a lot of good, smart bankers and they'll, they'll help you with that too. They'll say, Hey, we had appraisal that building and, our replacement cost replacement of that building is is twice what you had it listed. So we're just letting you know up front. So they'll, they'll help you. A lot of times your bankers are yeah. as much a pain in the neck as bankers can be sometimes. Uh, <laughs> sometimes they're really helpful. Yeah, there's some really good ones in this industry. Yeah, I mean, there really are. Yeah. Although we're in a niche industry, yeah, MJ, we know him quite well and done business through him and many of the others that you mentioned. And uh, yeah, there's some good folks in the century that will give you the proper guidance. Again, it goes back to finding that specialty agent. You also need to find that specialty lender or broker that knows the industry inside and out. The next mistake uh, that you had here on your list, uh, Kurt, your top 10 list was, is one that I probably is also very common, which is probably why it's on your top 10 list, is folks that are buying a mobile home park that it's coming with some park-owned home inventory. Uh, a lot of times, uh, those homes could be very old, maybe 60s, 70s models that they really don't have much value to them. They might be only worth a few thousand dollars, if that. And so a lot of owners say, well, why am I going to insure that? Because it's really only worth a couple grand. If something happens to it, big deal. I'll just you know buy another used home and bring it in. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I agree with that exact same thing you said. If it's one or two homes, uh, most of our park owners can handle a 6000 or 8000 or $10,000 loss from their cash reserves. And that's a good time to, to not stay with insurance. But w- when you have multiple homes, let's say you've got 15 of those homes, and the truth of the matter, there is no home out there you can replace for less than ten grand for just the mere cost of going and finding a similar a similar nineteen seventy home, picking it up, transporting it into your park, and installing it. If you can do that under ten grand, you're pretty special today. Uh, <laughs> so we we recommend you have a you you insure them all on a blanket policy. It's not typically very expensive to do it. Keep a bigger deductible again. You know, it serves your purposes. I don't want to turn in a five thousand dollar claim. Keep a bigger deductible. But then when you have that catastrophic loss, and let's say you've got fifteen of those, and a hailstorm comes through, and all fifteen need new roofs, that's uh, probably five to six thousand dollars each. Fifteen times five, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is about seventy five thousand dollars. And again, that's not very funny if you have to come with that much cash out of pocket all of a sudden. Is there a point in time where you might get pushed back from an insurer if you try to over insure something? Uh, you know, for example, yeah. we, we talked that it's, even if you bring an old used home in, even if it was given to you for free and you've got to move it and set it back up, you're lucky. I mean, you are special if you can get it done for 10 grand or under. In fact, $15,000 is the kind of number we use. And that's bringing in a, you know, a home that's probably 20 years old, getting it reset back up, some minor rehab so that it's moving ready. And so, Talk to me about the over-insuring aspect. I've got old homes. I want to insure them for 15000 because that's what it's going to cost me to get another used home back in there. But we all know that this home I'm insuring for fifteen really is not worth more than 3000 Is there going to be an issue there? Well, great, great point. And I would say that as long as you're at ten dollars to $15,000, you can argue that that's the value all day long. It, it, and the truth, because you could show it. You can show that if I go out and buy, find a similar home that's in decent shape, as decent as mine was, and pick it up, uninstall it, transport it, reinstall it, fix it up to my to, to standard. The last one is, I, you know, we've never had a problem where someone's come in and said that home was worth less than the ten thousand dollars you insured it for. Mm-hmm. Now, you, there is a, there is the old deal in insurance. It's never. I mean, I mean, never. You never want to overinsure because what happens for if you overinsure? is an insurance company comes in and say, okay, uh, Kevin and Kurt, you went out and bought that little office building and it, w- and it was $100,000 to replace, but you guys were thinking you might have a fire or a tornado any day, so you insured it for a million. When the insurance company comes out and looks at it, they're going to go, okay, great, yeah, we are going to replace it and we can replace it for $100,000. Here's your $100,000 uh, replacement cost. They pay mm-hmm. you the replacement cost or what you insured it for, whichever's less. Sure. So, you don't want to overinsure, but you, with mobile home inventory, 
I, I think you can get away with 10 to 15 on the worst of homes. Then if you've got newer homes, then you know, look at your acquisition costs, your installation costs, and go buy that. That's what I typically recommend people do. If you bought a uh, used home and for 15000 and you brought it in your park and have it set, now you're at twenty, and then you spent $3,000 fixing it up, there's $23,000. Uh, we have never had a problem with an insurance company saying that's a bad value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another consideration, guys, when you're going through this exercise is that every market is very different. I mean, what I might be, what I might have to pay in North Carolina for a 1988, you know, metal on metal home. It's probably, I could probably find one for two or three grand. That same home in another part of the country, you you could end up paying $10,000 for it. I know that once you get up into the Northeast, homes are a little bit more expensive, a little bit harder to come by. For example, in Maryland, we have a number of communities there. They're quite expensive uh, all day, every day. If we go out and buy a used home that's you know, 20 years old, metal on metal, we're going to expect to pay probably eight to 10 grand. And so every market's a little different. Just know your market intimately as you go through this process. So um, Kurt, uh, number four, we kind of covered already, uh, which was buying insurance. We, we kind of beat this one up a little bit in the beginning. And I think people firmly understand that they need to be seeking out a specialist when they go to get insurance on their mobile home park property. And so your mistake number four is buying insurance from a non-specialty agent. So I think we can skip over that one unless you have something else to add to it. If not, we can move on. No, I mean, there's, there's, I'm not the only one in the country that does that, but the, the ones I do know, I've got a lot of good friends that do it, and, and they're just night and day better than the guy that doesn't know what a mobile home park insurance policy mm-hmm. should look at. Again, I agree with you. Say. Okay. Yeah. Well, mistake number five is not buying loss of business income and extended loss of business income coverage. And so, first and foremost, explain to those that are, that are listening, uh, in case they don't know what that even means, uh, what is loss of income insurance? Well, with the park, it's, it's critical because a lot of you park owners only own the real estate. You only own land. And so you're thinking, okay, um, what am I getting income? But with park owners, your real assets, the income, that's why you all, every one of us bought a mobile home park because it produces income for us. Mm-hmm. And you can't insure that income. So here are the classic example is a tornado comes through and uh, you've got a hundred site park. And after the tornado goes by, uh, now you've got a 50 site park. 50 of your homes have been removed from the community. And half the park shut down, or maybe the whole park is. That, that coverage will pay you some critical things. First, it will pay you to remove the debris of the tenant-owned homes in your park and clean off the street so you can reopen. And sometimes that's typically about $3,000 a home. So 50 times 3,000, that's 150,000. It'll also pay you the income you would have earned that you were earning prior to the storm until the time you reopen and once you reopen, it'll pay you the pre-storm earnings for another six months while you start filling your community back up again. And, uh, and that's when it's really important for you is, you know, you're a good manager, Kevin, and to know what to do once, you're got ha- once you reopen. How do I get my park refilled knowing that my insurance is going to stop in six months? In mm-hmm. most cases, most insurance companies like the, the true specialty park insurers will, will demand you have that coverage. But it's very typical for us to run into a mom and pop insurance policy that they haven't even heard about it, thought about it, whatever. And if they get hit by a big storm, they're probably bankrupt without that coverage. Those things don't happen that often. Mobile home parks aren't magnets for tornadoes like some people in the press would say. But when they do happen, they're catastrophic losses and they're big dollar numbers and that saves our property owners. Mm-hmm. Would that apply to a like an, a fire event as well or is it just for a you know, some type of uh, natural disaster, like a hurricane, tornado, something similar? It, it applies for fire. It applies for most everything, except the one thing that you got to be careful with, it typically, and I'll say typically, I'll say 99% of the time, does not apply to a flood. Most all insurance policies do not include flood as a covered peril in the loss of income. So fire, sure. Wind, sure. Uh, ice event that, uh, you know, Armageddon ice event or something like that, or uh, explosion of some sort in the park, those are all covered, but you've got to be real careful with the flood. We do write that coverage for as an extra side coverage, but it's expensive to the point to where um, most of our clients don't buy it. And uh, most of our clients are very choosy when they get into flood prone areas about their properties because that's an uninsured problem. Yeah. You know, we actually passed on a park last year. It was uh, two communities in West Virginia. One of them had I think about 16 homes that were not just in a flood plain, but they were, they were in a flood way 
which was a major concern. We actually had you guys bid out um, coverage on that on those homes that were in that floodway, and it it literally was it, it was cost prohibitive. The deal didn't work anymore because it was so expensive, and uh, so we ended up passing on the deal for that reason because the risk of loss there was significant. It was the equivalent to about twenty percent of the size of that community, twenty percent of the revenue of that community. That means that. You know, if they got wiped out, yes, we have insurance. The insurance is incredibly expensive. If they didn't get wiped out, the insurance is incredibly expensive, right? <laughs> Either way, yeah, right, right. Uh, it was a very challenging decision, and and uh, it just didn't work because of the cost of it. So, I want to talk about what you've seen. You've been in this industry now, what twenty two years, right? Is that is that the math? That's the math. That's, that's um, right. Yeah, think, that's oh, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've seen a lot. Obviously, you've been. You, you, you guys have processed probably a good number of claims due to natural disasters. And so we're talking about loss of income insurance and, you know, a hurricane tornado comes through, wipes out a portion or all of your community. You've got debris removal. They'll essentially pay, you know, the pre-disaster income up until the point in time to where the parks reopened. And I'm assuming that means infrastructure is back in place and it's at the point now where homes can be brought back in. Is that kind of the definition of that it's back open for business? Yes. And it, that can be a, a unusual that can be a difficult definition but yes i would say that's it when you're reopened and the site's available and you've got utilities to the site what are some backup options you talked about obviously being a good manager and understanding the business well enough to where you know how you're going to refill your community what have you seen some other park operators do because it's it's easier said than done sometimes i mean you have a hundred space community you lose half of the residents uh, number one hopefully those 50 residents that lost their homes hopefully they have insurance on them and hopefully uh, their insurance is going to pay to put another home back in that community right that's a the best case scenario that that occurs um, worst case scenario is number of them or all of them don't have insurance on their home. They get wiped out. They can't afford to go buy another home, move it back in. They're going to another state because they want to get away as far away from that natural disaster as possible. So now you have 50 empty pads and not necessarily a full plan B in place to how you're going to get those 50 pads reoccupied. So what have you seen as uh, successful options for park operators uh, based on your experience in this industry? Well, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Let me, like, I'll give an example first. Uh, one, we had a park in Oklahoma. It had, um, I want to say, 65 sites. Uh, it had 64 homes in it. It got hit by an F4 tornado right on the button that was on the ground for 25 miles, and it completely destroyed the park. There was no home left standing in the park. The pond was sucked out of the, out of the park. Oh, wow. Um, that I went and toured it afterward. The uh, homes looked like railroad tracks that a giant had come in and twisted under the underbelly. So they were complete wipeout. And what happened after that is we had that client properly insured. And what happened to get them f- filled back up is about our survey showed after the storm, about half of the tenants in the park had insurance. And about about 30 of them did. And of those 30, about 25 came back in the park with new homes. The other 30 or so didn't have insurance. They had spent all their money on wine, women, and song and wasted the rest. And the federal government, FEMA, came in in their wisdom and said, well, we really appreciate you guys carrying insurance, you smart people, you guys that did you right. We're not going to give you anything, but you guys that knuckleheads that didn't do anything right, we're going to give you a $30,000 check. And so of the end of those knuckleheads, they made a $30,000 check to about 30 or 40% went right down to the casino and spent it all that evening and had a heck of a weekend. <laughs> but the others came back. And then, the, then many other people from the region that also had homes destroyed immediately bought homes with, with FEMA checks that they had. And they came in and, and that park three months after the storm was completely full with new homes and the park owner had no mortgage on it because we paid it off with all of our loss of income coverage. Wow. So, Now, if that was a perfect scenario, but we do see instances where the manufactured home industry is good at quick. If you want to come quick, we're a great source. So when those events happen, we there's often people moving into your community that need housing right away. If you've got housing stock to pull in, sometimes our community owners have had to go out and take a loan. They call up Candace Doolin at 21st and, uh, they get a loan through the cash program and uh, fill their park up that way. We've had FEMA come in and, and rent every site in some parks the next day and fill up the park. So by and large, it's, it's still scary for that to happen to you. And it can be, it, it can be a very negative uh, financial event. But over the years, our clients have done pretty well, much better than apartment owner 
who has to rebuild. So it takes them seven months to get plans. It takes them another seven months to get approved and it takes them another year and a half to rebuild. And their loss of income quit many months ago. Mm-hmm. So we do better than most asset classes. But there are techniques to doing it. If it ever happens to you, certainly give me a call, whoever you are, and I'll walk through some ideas on getting your park up and going again. Okay, fantastic. Uh, that, that's some great advice there. And uh, I know that there's a list that FEMA has, guys, that you can get on as well. So you can get your, your community actually placed on FEMA's, I don't know what they call that list, but it's basically the call me list. Uh, if there's a natural disaster in that given area, you're basically saying like, hey, my community's here, we've got infrastructure in place, and we have the ability to bring temporary housing in. And uh, that way you're on their call list and will be one of the first ones that they call should a natural disaster occur to where there's homes that are wiped out. So let's move on to number six, Kurt, if we could. Uh, and so that's, th- this is regarding, you know, contractors that work for you. So you guys are going to have handyman, you're going to have sometimes just, uh, you know, it's going to be part-time work. Sometimes it's going to be, you're going to have multiple folks uh, working full-time. In any event, s- number six mistake is paying for insurance of every contractor that works for you. So can you speak to that a little bit? And uh, why should it be our responsibility to pay for their insurance? Shouldn't they, be, shouldn't they have their own? Well, you, you're, typically, if you've got people working on your property and doing contracting on your property and they cause a problem, it, it's often going to be your problem. If they cause a problem for third parties, it's going to be your problem, unless that guy is insured. A lot of these contractors are nice guys and you'd love to have them over for dinner or even have them over Thanksgiving dinner. And if they, <laughs> if they cause a million dollar problem, their only option is going to be paying you $20 a month for the next 30 years. They just can't help you unless they're insured. So we recommend that whenever you, whenever it's possible, and I'm not talking about guys that are mowing lawns or guys that are painting that are doing, you know, minimal dangerous things. I'm talking about people that are, re, you know, re doing moving dirt or doing digging, digging in the community or putting in roads or working with electricity and gas. If those people aren't insured, which most of those at that level should be, then if they cause a problem, it's a big problem. If they're not insured, it's going to fall right back to you. It's particularly the case if you've hired a third party to work for somebody. For instance, if you've hired an installer to come install a home in your park for Mrs. Smith, who you just sold that home to, and that installer is not in, not insured, you're 100% responsible for all his actions if, if something goes wrong. Now, if he has insurance, he pays first. If he doesn't, he still pays first, but if he's got nothing, you're just left sitting there. So that's a simple thing to do. We've got some excellent resources on our website on mobileagency.com. There's a form section. There's a couple of forms in there I just love called performance agreement for subcontractors, performance agreement for independent contractors. If you'll have everybody that works for you sign that, it's pretty clear. You're, it's your problem. If you cause a problem, uh, if, you, if you do cause a problem, no hard feelings. You just have to take care of it and you have to provide insurance. Now, again, if you get that, that if you're out in the rural area and you can't find anybody that's, that's insured to do a particular project, you might have to roll the dice at sometimes. But when you get a chance to choose one that's insured, ask them for something called a certificate of insurance. It's a, it's a, similar, it's a simple document they've been asked for before. If they can show it, it should show they have general liability insurance, which is typically the key. And workers' compensation, if they're subcontractors of yours, if they don't have that, then you know, because you're probably going to be in, in responsible for a problem they cause if they don't have it. Do you suggest that um, with that certificate of insurance that we, you know, that your clients send it to you guys to review to ensure that it's adequate coverage, or is it pretty standardized? If they have it, then more than likely, you know, all is well. We, we're happy to review it for you. If you want to send it to our agent, whoever your agent is at mobile, and most agents can look at it pretty quick and go, okay, this seems okay, good. But really, you're looking for a check mark by general liability, and you're looking for a check mark by workers' compensation for most of the people working. If they have that, and you'll see the limit out to the right of it, you should have at least a million dollars of coverage. They've got half a million. That's probably okay for most people. You prefer a million. And then just keep that. Keep that in a file for that subcontractor along with that signed performance agreement and just make it say, hey, as soon as you guys sign this contract, I'll pay you. But I'm not paying you until you sign the contract. They'll all sign it. Um, Our Mm -hmm. contract's not one of those terrible contracts that makes them, that's awful for subcontractors. It's very fair. It just says, if you cause something due to your negligence, you'll take care of it. No hard feelings. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. Let's move on to number seven. Th- this mistake is actually one I guarantee a lot of folks do not think about. <laughs> I mean, I could tell from firsthand experience of, of just buying communities from mom and pop operators or smaller operators that this is one that I, I guarantee nine out of 10 of them, it does not come to mind when you start talking about insurance coverage. And that is failure to include data breach and tenant discrimination coverage. Let's talk about this one. This is a, especially the discrimination coverage side of things. And I'm sure that you've got some even uh, horror stories that you've seen with some of your clients that have gone through data breaches as well. So can you speak to this a little bit, Kurt? Yeah. Um, general liability insurance treats discrimination claims as intentional acts. And intentional acts are, are not covered or specifically excluded in general liability insurance policies. So unless you have a specific rider or a, additional coverage for discrimination coverage in your community, you don't have it. And so that's when someone who alleges that Kevin would not insure to me and I'm handicapped and he wouldn't allow my pit bull to come in the park. And sure enough, that's a service animal. I'm going to sue Kevin and you've lost. The only question is how much have you lost? How much attorney's fees are you going to pay? It's a pretty cut and dried thing. So with all the people very, there's a lot of tender people out there today with regards to racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, handicap discrimination. If they think that you're causing a problem, You'll hear about it from them. Uh, We have a group in Oklahoma and Texas right now, a group of lawyers. They're calling up mobile home park owners and they're saying, hey, my name's Kevin Bupp. I got a great job. I'm moving to town. I need to rent a home. Okay, great. We'd love to see you. We got one available for you. Oh, and by the way, I've got a pit bull with me. He's uh, uh, He's my service animal. Is that a problem? And they're just dying for our park manager to go, no, no pit bulls. We don't allow pit bulls. They have to be properly trained to say, no, we, we, uh, we do allow service animals by federal law. You have to sign our service animal agreement, but we, we'll allow you. But if you do say no, you don't have uh, tenant discrimination coverage, uh, you're potentially on the uh, deal for not only significant legal fees, but a significant indemnity loss. Mm-hmm. And the same goes with uh, you know keeping private information. There's a a ton of rules and regulations now. I've got the private information of all these tenants, their date of birth, their social security number. If you lose that, there's about 10 or 15 different hoops you have to jump through in order to give them notice and fix their credit. And by the way, if they can't get that car loan the next day because you messed up the credit and now they can't get a job, you're liable for that too. So uh, those coverages are typically not that expensive to add if you can get them in most cases. If you can, add them. If not, uh, you just have an uninsured problem. What's the situation where someone might not be able to get this coverage on a community? Well, we have, um, we have talked to so many of our carriers that that's such a critical thing. Our key program carriers will now throw in those coverages sometimes for $100, $200, $300. It's a no-brainer. But in some of our other communities that don't fit a standard program, let's say you're, uh, you're buying a community that just needs a lot of work. It has a number of older homes. The roads are rough. And our, and our standard carriers, our program carriers won't insure it. So now we're going into the Lloyd's of London type market mm. and they don't offer those ancillary coverages. So we can still get them, but you have to end up paying extra money for them. Instead of getting them for two or $300, they might be $1,500 or $2,000 to add. And on a smaller community, that's a big number. So that would be an example when you have difficulty getting, you always can get it. The question is, what, it's, what is it going to cost you? Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Okay. Fantastic. Mistake number eight, calling an employee an independent contractor. This this is another one of those things that is incredibly prevalent in our industry, probably more common than not seeing this play out. And so talk to me about why this is such a big mistake and what we have to be aware of here. Well, if you call a worker, a contractor, and they really were an employee and they're hurt on the job, all you owe them is medical expenses and wages for life. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. So you've got to be careful. With you also own a, owe them up to your uh, prior withholding, you own prior overtime, and you own two times that, and you own legal fees. Mm-hmm. So the, the disincentive for making the mistake of calling someone a contractor that really is an employee are, are pretty big. So we always recommend if it's close, just go ahead and pay them as an employee. It's a little bit more work up front. Workers' compensation is a little bit more, a little bit of expense, not a lot. Anywhere from one to five percent of payroll, which most of our payrolls aren't very big to begin with, and you can sleep at night. 
workers' compensation is not an insurance policy. We like to place as an agency. It's a pain in the neck. We don't like to do it, but we do it for all of our clients because we think it's just smart business. So be careful about that, calling them what they are, because you'll find that most workers are very happy to be called contractors and be paid as contractors as opposed to employees because then you're not withholding their money. They're right. getting all of it and they're not going out and paying it. So as long <laughs> as they're healthy and happy and you haven't fired them, they're ha- they're going to let you do it. But the second there's a problem and that problem is they're hurt on the job or they're hurt somewhere or you fired them because they showed up drunk, then they're going to come back and go, whoa, 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 whoa. I really was an employee and you owe me overtime for the last two years. Plus you owe me back withholding. Plus you owe me my attorney's fees and you've lost. There is no defense for that once they're determined to be an employee. It's a, it's a very simple case to lose. The number one number of lawsuits, the uh, category of lawsuits in the United States civil court system today are lawsuits about employee payment, mm-hmm. and employee status. So just it's not worth it for park owners. We don't yeah. pay enough to... Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, underwrite your community as though that you're going to have those additional expenses associated with an employee versus a contractor. You know, don't don't try to cheap out and think that you're going to squeeze through this underwriting and just assume that they're going to be labeled, whether it's your manager or a handyman that's on site, whoever it might be. If you're debating whether or not they, which category they fall into, more than likely, it's an employee then. <laughs> so you're actually having that, that debate inside your mind. They're probably an employee and you need to underwrite accordingly and just do it the right way from the get go. If, if you're in California or Illinois or Connecticut or some of the states with very difficult employee laws, there's there's really not such a thing as a contractor anymore. You might think there is. Now, if you're in Texas or the Midwest, they've got they've got more leeway on what you can call a contractor. And if you have someone that's managing your park that has a professional management company and they also manage other properties, yeah, that's an independent contractor. Right. Pay them and treat them as such. But uh, most of the people that only work for you, that's the only place they work. Most of those, when a push comes to shove, they're mm-hmm. probably going to be determined to have employee status. So uh, you might as well plan for it right now. Mm-hmm. And it kind of leads into your mistake number nine, which is about work, uh, workers' comp. And I know that we, we kind of touched on that a little bit. Is there anything else you'd like to add there regarding owners of property not buying workman's comp insurance when needed? Well, workers' compensation insurance is pays medical expenses and wages for life if called upon to do so. Mm-hmm. So I like it as a investor myself because it's one of those catast- potentially catastrophic losses that you just could never overcome and it's a it's a deal killer if it happens to you so i like it yeah. policies are going to start anywhere from three to four hundred dollars five hundred dollars a year is about what they cost no one wants to spend five hundred dollars a year but uh, uh i i do it i've had a, i've carried in workers comp on my employees at the insurance agency forever i've never had a claim but i sleep every night when i go home and and it's it's just, uh, it's just, a, it's a pretty simple thing to do. So, if yeah. you're thinking about it, if it's borderline, I'd recommend you do it. We personally, we we would rather you not. We don't. It's a big pain in the neck for us to place, but yeah, you should do it. Yeah, and again, it goes back to what I just mentioned, guys. When you're looking at communities, just underwrite this stuff into them. I mean, as, as part of your overall expenses to operate that, don't don't underwrite it and, and, and omit this type of very important information. And don't buy a deal so tight that you can't literally afford to pay someone as an employee or provide workman's comp insurance. It's just, it's not, it's really not worth it, right? I mean, peace of mind is, is worth infinite amount of money. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I agree. Number 10 mistake. Last, last mistake, not the biggest one. We had, these are all big. These are all equal in nature. I mean, some bigger than others. These are all big ones, but uh, number 10, when you sell homes, not including this coverage on your policy, general liability, I'm assuming is, is what you mean. If you sell a home, actually, why don't you tell me what you mean by this one? I'm, I'm actually reading through <laughs> it and it, it, define that for me, what you mean by mistake number 10, if you would. Well, well, you know, uh, 20 years ago, most park owners didn't sell homes or want to mess with homes. They just sat back there, let the phone call ring, and just lease sites. But today, we're all selling homes. And a manufactured home is a pretty big ticket item, has a lot of things moving for it. And if you sell it, you're responsible for things that go wrong with it. And here's a dirty little secret. Every general liability insurance policy out there includes something called a your product exclusion. And if your insurance company defines a manufactured home as a product, you have no coverage for any sales liability, product liability, anything on that home. So you just can't live with that. So you should be asking your agent, does my insurance define the manufactured home as a product? If it does, I'm not going to have any coverage. When I sell that house, and sure enough, three, you know, three years later, there's electrical short, the house burns down, everybody's killed inside the home. That's product liability. 
that's a million, that's a whatever you got loss on it. So, or I sold a home and sure enough, three years later, the gas, there's a gas leak in the home and everybody in the house is uh, asphyxiated. And these are all real examples I'm giving you. That loss, again, if you don't have this proper coverage, which we try to build in in all of our park owner policies, is a catastrophic loss event. It's an it's a end of investment problem. Mm-hmm. Does this also apply to brand new homes or is this more uh, for selling used homes? It, it applies to both new and used homes because okay. you can have problems with them both. But uh, with the brand new homes, you typically have a little help because you're going to have a manufacturer sitting at a defense right. table with you in those events. And they, they tend to be helpful and people tend to go after manufacturers as hard or harder as our park owners in those instances. So mm-hmm. less it. with a new home, more with the used. But if you're buying and selling homes in your community, you need to have that cover. There's just You have to have that coverage, I would say it that way. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. Well, Kurt, we covered a lot here. Is there anything else that you feel is uh, incredibly relevant to uh, the folks that are listening in uh, as it pertains to adequate insurance coverage for their mobile home park? I think I've probably worn everybody out on the insurance. Uh, we did a great talk yeah. about it. I would say uh, a couple of resources that we have on our website. Everybody's welcome to, whether you're a client or not, on mobileagency.com. We have a loss control section with a number of great forms. We have a video section and we've got a, we've, we made a new video here recently for manufactured home community managers. It's about a seven minute long video. I would recommend that everybody make it as part of their onboarding process. Every time they hire a manager assistant that they watch that video, it's, it goes through a lot of the stuff we talked about, but it does it pretty quickly in about seven minutes and it's, it's somewhat enjoyable to watch. So just look in the video section of our website and you'll find it. Okay, fantastic. And that's mobileagency.com, correct, Kurt? That's correct. Okay, fantastic. Well, we really appreciate you coming to the show here. I mean, you shared a lot of great information with us today. And um, now I'd like to enter into what I would like to call the mobile home park words of wisdom. And this is where we're going to kind of wrap things up uh, for the day. And if you had any final words of wisdom that you could leave with the new or aspiring park investors that um, that would motivate them and inspire them as they progress in their mobile home park investing career, what would those last words of wisdom be? I would say the best management advice I would give a community, and I think this is a great investment as a general rule, most of our clients have done well, is when you have a community, have a decent set of community rules and regularly and respectfully enforce them. If you'll do that, your tenants will be happy enough and you'll have a better investment. Happy tenants don't tend to sue owners like upset ones do. You don't have to yell and scream at them to enforce a rule. Just, gee, if you have to clean up your yard, I know it's a tough rule, but that's what everybody has to do. Mrs. Mr. Smith, please get it cleaned up. No hard feelings. Mm-hmm. No, that's great advice. I thought you were just going to tell us, get insurance. <laughs> which, which would also be great. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, guys, again, to learn more about Kurt and his company, you can visit him at mobileagency.com. And as he had mentioned, there's lots of great resources on his website, lots of great informational videos. And Kurt, with that, really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. I know it took some time for us to coordinate schedules, more so my schedule than anything to get you on here, but I'm glad you're here. And uh, I know that our listeners were able to gain a lot of value from here from the show. And so guys, I want to thank you for joining us here today on the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. And then until we meet again next week, make it a great one. Congratulations for taking the necessary steps to achieving massive success through the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Be sure to visit our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com, to download your free digital ebook version of the 21 biggest mistakes investors make when buying their first mobile home park and how you can avoid them. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our free monthly mobile home park investing newsletter which is jammed full of valuable tips, tricks, and strategies to help you accelerate your path to success as a mobile home park investor. More information about this podcast and its hosts can be found by visiting mobilehomeparkacademy.com.